All right, so uh, now we get to the first um, hands-on session. Um, I hope uh, some of you have already uh, started exploring uh, the notebook, uh, but I'll walk you through the first steps and then uh, I'll let you all get to work and I will be here uh, to and walk around to uh, answer any questions or any problems that you may uh, run into. Um, and we're going to start here with the second one. So you can just open the, uh, the notebook. Um, <clears throat> uh, I guess I've blocked for now. Okay, so th this is a uh, tutorial on cross-matching Gaia DR3 and the NASA Exoplanet Archive. And the aim of this in the end is to uh, take profit from the uh, 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 good um, astrophysical parameters that we provide with Gaia. So distances to stars, but of course, things like temperature, but also the radius, et cetera, all of the things that enter into characterizing uh, the planet itself. And, uh, and, and this is, I think the Gaia DR3 data are not yet in the exoplanet archive. I suppose they will be entered at some point, uh, but today then we uh, learn how to uh, do it yourself. So this cross match between these two um, archives, but we'll start with some simple queries on the Gaia archive uh, itself. So um, if not already done, please get an account in the uh, Gaia um, archive. It's not needed for the start of the uh, hands-on session, but at some point it's uh, when, when we start doing the cross match with the exoplanet archive, you really do need uh, an account. Um, how do I scroll? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, the first uh, step uh, is to um, install the required um, Python uh, packages when you're uh, to, to work with the uh, with this notebook. And basically the only thing that we need to install the, all the rest of the stuff that you need is already uh, installed for you by Google is this um, uh, Astro Query uh, package and the um, Astro Query uh, package is uh, is what you need to access the Gaia um, archive itself. Yeah. If you use the Python notebook, then they don't need that. Uh, yes, so correct. Google. Yeah. So this is only for this step is only for the Google Colab. If you separately use the Python notebook, of course, then you have done your own installation already of the uh, of the of, of this um, Astro Query uh, package, or it's part of your distribution or whatever. Okay. So this is not very interesting. It installs the package. It's uh, it's all worked. Um, we import a couple of uh, Python uh, packages, uh, NumPy, Matplotlib, the usual things you need to uh, to do your work. Here is the um, import of the Astro Query um, uh, package to uh, talk to the archive. Um, and there's also the import of a package uh, to talk to the NASA um, Exoplanet Archive. So they've also uh, done an effort to make sure that you have programmatic access to uh, Python. Uh, we need uh, the AstroPy table uh, facility. Um, well, I think actually we don't need it anymore. Never mind. And this ITER tools here is for one of the more complicated uh, uh, exercises later on. So let's import. Uh, then some uh, matplotlib uh, settings. So this is just uh, the way the plots will look. This happens to be what I like. If you like something different, just change those and uh, it's no problem. <clears throat> okay, and then we uh, go for uh, a first uh, talking to the actual uh, Gaia archive. And the first thing we want to do is to generate an overview of all the tables that are available in uh, the Gaia archive. Uh, so we use the, um, uh, the Gaia, uh, this Astro Query package for Gaia uh, to, uh, to do this. So this is this instruction, load tables, and it asks only for the names of the tables, not, uh, not all the data. And then we iterate over this list of table names to inspect it. So we just print out the uh, table names. So let's run that. So here it's retrieved all the, uh, all the table names. And as I said before, this is uh, a really a large uh, release. So we have about uh, 90 uh, tables uh, available and you can see all of them uh, listed uh, over here. So we're not gonna go through that now in detail, but it's uh, uh, something that you can, can do later on by yourself if you're um, interested. Uh, but of course you can also go to the web interface of uh, the archive, which is probably a bit more convenient for inspecting all the available um, tables. 
Okay, then we do a first uh, actual query and we're gonna query the Gaia catalog of, uh, of nearby stars. This will also be used tomorrow by uh, Jackie and her uh, hands-on session. So here we're only gonna look at a small fraction of this catalog. So this is the catalog that um, was published as part of Gaia EDR tree. And it's a very careful inventory of all stars within hundred parsecs uh, from the sun, uh, but we're gonna limit ourselves to the nearest um, 25 uh, parsec. So, um, one thing to note is that this uh, Gaia catalog of nearby stars lives in a particular uh, uh, namespace of the Gaia archive. It's called external.gaiaedr3gcns-main1, uh, not a particularly obvious name, so that's why I give it, uh, give it here. Um, and here is the actual uh, query that we run on the, uh, on the archive. The query that, is, um, that you see here, uh, the, the, the stuff between uh, quotes, you could also actually fill that in on the web interface on this uh, search page and you will get exactly the uh, same result. So let's uh, run this. It should be fairly quick. Yeah, query is, is finished. And then we just print some information on the uh, table that comes out of this, uh, of this job. Um, and we see here that it's uh, about uh, two and a half thousand stars that are contained within this uh, 25 uh, parsecs coming out of this guy catalog of nearby stars. And here we just queried a few uh, fields. So we asked for the uh, source ID, uh, the position of the star in the sky, its parallax, and also the uh, photometric information that is contained in Gaia broadband photometry, so the G-band magnitude and the BP and RP um, uh, magnitudes. Okay, so then um, uh, here we make a first uh, plot. This is a simple color magnitude diagram. Uh, so we just simply plot the, uh, the uh, color of the star on the horizontal axis and the uh, bright, apparent brightness on the vertical axis, so let's make the plot. Um, and this is just to give you an idea if you're not familiar with Python at all or with matplotlib, how you make plots in, uh, in, in matplotlib. And this is uh, the uh, color magnitude diagram for all stars within 25 parsecs from the sun that are in the uh, Gaia catalog. So again, about two and a half thousand objects in this, in this plot. Of course, you see already uh, the main sequence. You see some white dwarfs uh, over here and this tail of stars going uh, all the way to um, uh, bluer colors again at the faint end. This is an artifact of the fact that we have overestimated the flux in the BP uh, band. So this is one of the systematic issues in the uh, Gaia, uh, in the current Gaia uh, data release. And you can find uh, information in the papers on this and on how to uh, deal with this. Okay, so now we get to the uh, first uh, question, which is to plot an observational uh, Hertzsprung-Russell diagram uh, for these same stars. So this it's just a straight up uh, color magnitude diagram using the apparent brightness, but now we want to have an actual observational Hertzsprung Russell diagram um, and where you need to use the absolute magnitude on the vertical axis. So I'll let you get to it and uh, um, I give you a couple of minutes uh, to work on this. This should be fairly straightforward and then we go on to the next uh, question. In the meantime, And if anybody has problems, you can, in the room, we have helpers, so you can raise your hand. And you can also post in Slack, and we have helpers monitoring Slack as well. <laughs> yeah, you had the equation in there. Right? Okay. <clears throat>
And of course, you're allowed to copy paste the code that's already there and just modify the relevant line, right? <clears throat> All right, has, uh, has everyone already managed to make an HR diagram? No? <laughs> has anyone managed to make an HR diagram yet? Yes, very good, very good. <laughs> okay, then we, then we go to the, I'll just show you the, uh, the answer. And of course you can, you can look at it again at your leisure. Um, so this is a, a notebook that has the um, answers in it. Um, so this was the uh, color magnitude diagram that we just uh, produced, and this is the um, HR uh, diagram. And the uh, relevant line of code is uh, line number four, which calculates the uh, absolute magnitude, um, and that is adding five times the log 10 base logarithm of the parallax and then subtracting 10. It's essentially the same formula that Dan uh, showed this morning, but then in, uh, in terms of parallax, and we use units of milli arc seconds here. So if you think about that a little bit, you'll understand the, uh, the formula. And then if you plot the, uh, the absolute magnitude versus color, you get the uh, resulting diagram. And you can see that uh, it's very much tighter in uh, the main sequence and the white dwarf sequence than uh, before, because of course here we had the spread in distance uh, stars are spread anywhere between 1 and 25 uh, parsecs. And if we correct for uh, this distance effect and plot their absolute luminosities, you can see how very nicely uh, tight the uh, main sequence is and also the white dwarf uh, sequence. And here at the bottom, you can see a bit more uh, spread. And this has to do both with the photometric quality of the data, but also the astrometric errors that go up, of course, as the star gets uh, a lot uh, fainter. Okay, so this was a very... Uh, straightforward exercise to start with, mainly also to show you how to use this uh, tool to query, to make simple queries in the Gaia um, archive. Okay, <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> go back to the other notebook. So now the question is that, can you modify the query that we just uh, used above? So uh, uh, this uh, query over here, can you modify it? in order to download not the uh, Gaia photometry, but to download the photometry in the SDSS system, which is also contained in this Gaia catalog of, uh, of nearby stars. Um, and uh, as a hint, you can look up in the astroquery.gaia documentation, how you can actually inspect the contents of a particular table and that way find out um, what, the, uh, what the relevant columns are that you should be asking for. So again, I'll give you a few minutes to, uh, to, uh, to do this. And of course you can, again, simply modify the code that is above. So copy paste and modify the query uh, in order to get the SDSS uh, photometry. So I've already put three uh, different blocks, one to inspect the uh, table itself. That is a particular query one to select the SDSS photometry from the table and then uh, to make the SDSS photometry version of the observational HR diagram that we just made with the Gaia data, with the Gaia photometry.
Okay, has anyone managed to uh, figure out how to inspect the table with the Python interface? Yes? Okay. Um, has anyone actually gotten to plotting the observational HR diagram with the Sloan uh, photometry? Difficult step is the first one. Yeah, good. Okay, let's, uh, let's have a look at the answers so we can get to the more um, interesting questions uh, about the cross-matching. Um, so basically here's the uh, code to uh, inspect the uh, table. Um, so, well, you could just see the, the, the code for yourself. I'll, I'll let you read that uh, uh, on your own. Uh, but the bottom line is that you can iterate over the uh, columns in the table and then print out for every column some information on uh, the, the name of the column, but it also comes with the short description of what is actually um, in there. And if you then uh, scroll down, you will uh, see that here there is um, a photometry in the uh, Sloan system. So these are in fact the, the columns that you should um, ask for uh, in the subsequent query if you want to plot not the Gaia photometry, but the uh, Sloan uh, photometry. So this means that we um, modify the uh, previous uh, query. And what I've done here is um, uh, I've replaced the uh, Gaia photometry with the columns that contain all the uh, Sloan bands. So here G, I, R, and, uh, and Z. And the rest of the query is essentially the same. You're only asking for different uh, photometry. And then of course, the uh, plotting of the HR diagram is straightforward. You replace the, uh, uh, the, the Gaia photometry with the uh, Sloan one. And here I made absolute uh, Sloan G magnitude versus uh, G minus I. But of course, you can also look for other uh, combinations of, uh, of photometry. Um, and you notice that this diagram looks a whole lot less clean than the one by uh, Gaia. And this is an illustration of the very high precision that we get on our photometry, the homogeneity of it, which allows you to make much cleaner um, HR diagrams. Now, of course, this is not to disrespect the uh, Sloan survey. Uh, Sloan is, uh, is uh, better than Gaia for many um, other aspects, in, for example, in terms of going much uh, deeper, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But this is an illustration of how good the photometry of Gaia uh, is compared to uh, ground-based surveys. Okay, so now we get to the uh, next question. And this is about the uh, querying of the uh, NASA Exoplanet Archive. So we start with just a query um, on the uh, NASA Archive uh, itself. And here uh, I'll just demonstrate first and then we get to the uh, cross-matching um, exercise. Um, so there is this uh, Python package, uh, part of AstroQuery as well, that allows you to talk to the uh, Exoplanet uh, Archive. Um, and here I'm, uh, I'm defining uh, the query itself. So I define first all the columns that I want to have from the Exoplanet Archive. And I've already selected the columns that we will need uh, later on in the exercise. So we're looking for the planet name, the name of the host uh, star, uh, the sky position, uh, and then the uh, Gaia magnitude as it's listed in the uh, NASA Exoplanet Archive. And this is the Gaia DR DR2 G-band magnitude. And we'll see later on why this is useful when doing a cross match to DR3. And we also get all the astrophysical parameters. So the temperature, log G, metallicity, uh, et cetera. Uh, in particular, also the radius and age that are listed currently in the Exoplanet Archive. And these are based on a variety of different uh, uh, surveys, uh, et cetera. Um, and, and the idea, of course, is that we're going to replace these eventually with the ones from Gaia by doing this uh, cross match. So if we, uh, if we run this, uh, this query, <clears throat> wait a little while <coughs> for it to finish. OK, the query is done. And we can just print the uh, contents of this uh, exoplanet table. And uh, you see that it has a length of about uh, 5,000 rows. So there's about 5,000 um, exoplanets currently um, in the archive. And you see a little bit of the contents, the planet name, the name of the host star, and here are the ages. And, the, and this last uh, column over here, sky coordinates, is automatically generated during a query. Uh, and we'll get rid of that later because it's not needed for the uh, cross match. OK. <clears throat> So now we're gonna to go to the uh, cross-matching of the Exoplanet Archive with uh, Gaia, and we'll make use of the cross-matching facilities that exist in the Gaia Archive. And this means that you have to upload the table that we just created from the NASA Exoplanet Archive to the Gaia Archive. And that's why you need um, a, a user account there, because otherwise you cannot upload uh, tables for, for use uh, later on. So here's a, a, a line that, uh, that uh, allows you to log in 
uh, to the guy archive so you can uh, fill in your own uh, username uh, over here and it will automatically be transferred to the code and if you are not on colab then you will not have this form but you can of course modify uh, the line of code that says username equal aga brown or your username of course and then uh, you do the login uh, step so let's run this it asks you now for the password and then you're logged into the uh, Gaia archive. Okay, so a couple of things uh, to note. Um, <clears throat> if we have, we have at this point in principle not yet created any uh, user tables, but maybe you already have in a previous try of the uh, notebook and those user tables then exist in your uh, user space in the Gaia um, archive. Um, and if they already exist there, it's, you should delete them because if you try to upload them again, they will collide in terms of names and you will get an error. Uh, so this step is only needed if you've already created those uh, user tables and i know i have so i will uh, run this step to delete them from the uh, archive uh, what is going on okay maybe i've already gotten rid of them before okay we'll see uh, we'll see later on um, the other way to delete the uh, tables, if it doesn't work with the uh, Python, is that you go into the web interface of the archive, and if you look at the, uh, at the tables, there is a, a section called user tables, and this is where all your user created tables live. You see here the three ones uh, that we will generate in this um, exercise, and you can just click on this highlighted button over here after uh, ticking the boxes next to the tables that you want to delete and then you can get rid of them in the archive and continue the um, exercise. So there's two ways you, you can use to, uh, to delete the tables. Okay, so let's uh, start with step one from the cross match. So we have created this table from the NASA Exoplanet Archive with the information that we want to use uh, later on, in particular now the uh, positions of stars uh, on the sky. And so we'll upload this into the uh, Gaia Archive with this um, instruction and you give the table a particular name uh, of course, you can change this to whatever you like, uh, but we'll, we'll use this one here. <clears throat> so I hope this now works. Yeah, so it's uploaded the Exoplanet Archive table. So the errors that I got previously were because I had already deleted them. So trying to delete them again, of course, uh, gives, a, gives an error. Okay, then we go to, uh, to step two, and that is we are going to do a positional cross match between the NASA Exoplanet Archive and the Gaia data. So both of them have the right ascension and declination listed, um, but these might be slightly different because Gaia DR3, of course, uh, is a, a new set of star uh, positions for a slightly different epoch. The positions in the uh, NASA Exoplanet uh, Archive, uh, I haven't looked at the details, but it could be, for example, that they are for epoch 2000, but for Gaia, they are epoch 2016.0, they're updated. So we're gonna do, a, so uh, you have to do a cross match between them with some uh, margin for the, for the difference between, uh, between the positions, but we'll come to that uh, just now. So um, the, uh, yeah, just a, just a note on uh, the table we just uploaded, it will be given a particular name in the archive, which is user, your username, and then dot exoplanet um, archive. Um, and then the second thing that we need to do is we need to mark in this table the fact that RA and DEC, those two columns, are the actual position of the star on the sky. And so the, the cross-match algorithm in, in the Gaia archive needs to know for the two tables that it matches which of the columns it needs to look at to, uh, to look up the sky positions, because it might be that you've given this a, very, a different name, for example, RAJ2000. This is what you sometimes uh, see. Okay, so if we uh, run this now, so we... Um, we make, first of all, the, the fully qualified uh, table name to use that in the, uh, in the instructions to the archive. Uh, we give the resulting table, which is the cross-matched uh, table between the NASA archive and Gaia. We call that exoplanets underscore Gaia. And we're going to use a search radius. As I said, the positions between the two catalogs might be different. So you have to allow for the fact that the, that the stars might have moved in between or that the positions are just different for other reasons. And we're going to use a search radius here for of one um, arc second. Uh, so any two, two objects in those two tables that are located together to within one arc second, we will consider that a, a match. 
Okay, so this instruction over here uh, marks the RA and DAC columns as containing the uh, sky uh, coordinates. And this is actually something you can also do directly in the web interface uh, in, the, in the archive, but I'll use this uh, programmatic uh, method over here. And then the last uh, couple of lines of code do the actual cross match. So basically what you do is I have, you tell the guy archive, I have a table A and a table B, uh, both with, uh, start of, with uh, sky positions in them please match them for me with the search radius, in this case of one um, arc second. So let's do the, uh, uh, let's do this. So we've updated now the exoplanet table with the marking those columns as containing the sky positions. And now the uh, query is, uh, is finished. So the cross match is done. Um, <clears throat> Um, and now we have generated a, uh, a table called uh, user, user uh, in this case, AJ Brown dot exoplanets uh, underscore Gaia, as we asked for uh, before. Um, and it contains only three columns. It contains the um, exoplanet archive, uh, what is called the original uh, ID. So that's the original ID, in this case, the planet name or, or, or the row number essentially coming from the um, exoplanet table. It has the Gaia source ID in there and a separation. So that's the angular separation um, on the sky. So as I said, everything that is uh, within one arc second from each other is considered a match. So this angular separation will never be larger than the search radius, but it's of course something that you can use later on to judge whether the um, cross match has been done uh, correctly. Okay, so we're gonna uh, use this data now to construct a, a table uh, with all the with the matches and all the Gaia DR3 data that we would actually like to have for the uh, host stars in order to start investigating uh, the planets with the updated stellar parameters uh, from Gaia. <clears throat> so um, the cross match table, uh, okay, we, we uh, construct uh, the name again, uh, so that will be, um, uh, uh, let's see, where is the, we had it up here cross match table name exoplanets Gaia. So we construct this again. These are the Gaia columns that we want to have. So the source ID, uh, RA DAC uh, parallax, the parallax over error, we will use later on uh, photometry from Gaia. And we're also interested in the um, extinction, uh, the reddening and uh, a distance parameter, which is also uh, estimated as part of the astrophysical parameterization. So this is not the inversion of the parallax, but it's a separately estimated distance, which of course does take into account the uh, parallax information, but also all the other information that we have um, on the source. Um, <clears throat> then uh, here we construct the, uh, the actual uh, query um, itself. I will not go over all the uh, details. It's better if you read that uh, uh, at your leisure and we just execute that. And then we will get a new uh, table that has the um, exoplanet data as well as the uh, Gaia data in there. This warning here you can ignore. This is something, uh, technical details in the background. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't matter. Um, and then we uh, print out here uh, the number of matches that were found. So within one arc second, we have 5,018 matches out of the 5,060 exoplanets. So we've managed to match almost every exoplanet host star to some source in the uh, Gaia catalog. Okay, so now we come to question number three, and this is a bit more uh, involved. Uh, so let's see how far, uh, how far we get. So um, the, the idea now is that we try to come up with ways of judging whether the matches are actually reliable. So we have these 5,000 matches, but has, has the query actually identified for each host star the correct matching source in the Gaia catalog? That doesn't have to be uh, the case. There are a variety of reasons why the match might be uh, the wrong one. And you want to make sure, of course, that you've matched to the uh, correct star uh, in order to uh, study your um, planet. So that's uh, three sub questions. So um, the first one is, uh, can you come up with uh, some basic checks of the uh, cross matches? Uh, so here I'm just thinking about make some plots that you can, uh, uh, that can help you spotting uh, wrong matches between the um, uh, exoplanet archive and the uh, Gaia data. Uh, then the second is, is um, once you've done that, um, identify uh, the exoplanets that are matched to war more than one uh, Gaia DR3 source. So this is also something that can happen that you, that you get within the one arc second search radius, more than one candidate uh, source in the Gaia archive that might be a match to your host star. Uh, so how do you actually decide which of the two is the uh, correct match? That's, what, that's part of the first question. And the second one then is identify those uh, wrong matches. Um, 
And so uh, uh, once you've done the first two questions, you can uh, come up with a criterion for actually saying, okay, this is a bad match. I get rid of that one and I retain uh, the other one. And the question there also is to find a way uh, to filter out these uh, bad matches from the table that you uh, created. Um, I, there are some hints as well for, uh, the, um, for the questions themselves and the helpers have more uh, extensive hints uh, available. And as I said, this is a more uh, complicated question. Uh, so uh, I'll give you some time to work on it, uh, but uh, I'll also go through the answers uh, later on. Uh, and again, of course, you can repeat this throughout the week uh, if you want to, uh, to better understand this. Okay, so let's get to work.
I don't believe it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've, I've tripped up on that many times and said I got it. No, it actually the app the app button refers to all of these songs. Version button of the app. Yeah. Yes. But, but, we have to but our, our whole is tricky fitness for the whole thing. Yeah. No, not just for the Yeah, but if you have a catalog Okay, we have uh, about 10 minutes left before the end of the uh, session. So I think I'm gonna show you uh, the answer and uh, it's the answer I have here is one particular way to do it. Uh, but there are of course other ways to judge whether the matches between two catalogs are uh, correct or not. Um, but let's have a look. <clears throat> Okay, so here's um, two plots that I uh, made to, uh, to inspect the uh, matches uh, that were made between uh, the two uh, catalogs. Um, one of them is simply a histogram of the angular uh, separations. So the idea there is maybe you can identify a population of stars that stands out at large angular separation near the uh, edge of the search radius. And that could be indicative of, uh, of bad matches. In this case, it's not really clear that that's the case. It looks all relatively fine. But here, what we do is we look at the, uh, as I said before, we have in the table that we created, the G-band magnitude, both from Gaia DR2 and Gaia DR3. And if the match is correct, those two should be the same, or at least almost the same. Of course, the Gaia photometry also evolves from one release to the next but you don't expect that the uh, difference in G-band magnitudes will be much more than a few hundreds or something uh, like that. So if you look in this plot, which shows the difference in DR2 and DR3 G-band magnitude as a function of the angular separation, then suddenly you notice that for stars or for matches that are close to the edge of the search radius, there's a lot of them that have large differences in uh, magnitude, and those are probably bad matches. So those are cases where uh, the exoplanet host star was matched to more than one Gaia source. And one of them is okay. There's a, almost no difference in magnitude and the other one is clearly very different. So that must be a wrong uh, match. Okay, so if we go further down. So this is um, uh, the second part of the uh, question which looks at uh, how many exoplanet host stars have more than one match in Gaia uh, DR3. 
so basically what, you, what it does here is it uses um, the uh, Python list facilities and uh, the way you can iterate over lists, et cetera, um, to um, identify uh, the duplicate uh, matches. So basically it looks for um, stars that, or, or uh, yeah, host planet names that occur twice in the list. So those must have been matched to more than one uh, Gaia DL3 source. And you then put all the uh, list of duplicates uh, together using these uh, Python uh, tools. I won't explain this in detail. It's easier if you go over it yourself, but you have the code here. Um, and then uh, here's the list of all the multiple matches. So it's a table that has a length of 103. Uh, which to, uh, to first uh, order might look a bit strange because if it's, a, if it's uh, host stars with two matches, you would expect an even number, but sometimes there's even three matches to the same uh, source. So that, and that happens here in, uh, in one case. So you can see, for example, Coro 21B, the host star is, measure, is matched to two different uh, Gaia sources in DR3. And you can see here the uh, photometric uh, the, or the, the G-band magnitude of those sources in DR3 and this is a G-band magnitude listed in the NASA Exoplanet Archive. And from this one, you can immediately see that the first match must be the correct one. And then if you look at the separation, this first match also has the closest um, angular distance. Um, and, and you can inspect the table uh, for more of these, uh, of these cases. So you basically look at the combination of the angular separation and the difference in magnitude. Another suggestion that I heard from Salvador was to look at the... Uh, Parallax, for example, you can also uh, look at the parallax difference between DR2 and DR3. Uh, probably in this case, the parallax will also be, uh, be very different because it's the wrong match. But magnitude is a simple way of doing that. Okay, so here we now plot only for the, for the sources with two matches or more in the Gaia catalog. We plot the angular separation, and now you can clearly see two populations. You see very small angular separations. These are probably the good matches. And you can see here larger angular separations close to the search radius. Um, and if you then plot again the, uh, the magnitude difference as a function of angular separation, you can clearly see that at about 0.2 arc seconds uh, angular separation, you start to see a lot of these uh, bad matches, right? So uh, in principle, what you can do uh, to, as to design a criterion to get rid of the uh, bad matches, in this case, it's probably enough to just look at the angular separation. So everything that is above about 0.2 arc seconds angular separation is not a good match and we just get to get rid of that. And that's here in this uh, code block uh, is, uh, is how you um, identify uh, all these um, uh, matches that are uh, above your uh, criterion. Um, and in this way you can remove those uh, 52 uh, bad matches that were in the uh, previous uh, table. And then you're left with a little bit less than 5,000 uh, matches between the NASA Exoplanet Archive and Gaia uh, DR3. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's how it works. Okay, so um, <clears throat> question four is about plotting once you've done all this, um, and I, I, I propose that we basically stop here and you can continue uh, later today or tomorrow in the other hands-on session. But once you've got your cleaned up table of exoplanets, you can actually go uh, to the next question and that asks you to make an observational uh, HR diagram of the exoplanet host stars, um, and, uh, I'm ask, or, and I'm asking them to make two plots, one using directly the parallaxes from Gaia DR3, and the other one using the distances that were estimated uh, as part of the astrophysical uh, parameterization pipeline. And you will notice that there are subtle differences in the two HR diagrams, and the question there is, can you identify why uh, this might be uh, the case, what is, what is going on uh, there? So that's something uh, for, uh, for later on that you can try to do uh, by yourself. Um, and so for now, I propose that we uh, stop. It's almost uh, five o'clock. I think everyone is ready for a little break. And then, uh, then there is the uh, dinner, uh, et cetera. Yeah. So thanks for your uh, attention. <laughs>